Hey, everybody. Welcome to Naturalistics, a podcast dedicated to helping you become a better naturalist. My name is Stefan. Here with me is Matt. And today on Naturalistics, we are really excited to be interviewing our friend and fellow naturalist and tracker, Sophie Mazawita. Our first uh, international interview. She is, yeah, she's a Canadian now based in Burlington, <laughs> Vermont. Yeah, she's uh, been doing some traveling recently and is involved with some tracking stuff there in uh, in Burlington, and we're really psyched to be t- able to talk with her. And you can find us on Instagram. We got a bunch of photos up there. Twitter, send us a tweet. Email us at naturalisticspod at gmail dot com. We actually have a Facebook page now, so you can find us there. Like us, subscribe to us, leave a comment, all that kind of good stuff. It helps uh, other people find us. You know, the more people are are interacting with us on the internet, the more the internet interacts with us. I guess. And uh, now we're, we'll just head on over to the interview. Yeah, here we go. Hey, Sophie, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's, great. it's a great opportunity to have you on, on the podcast. Sophie is a friend, friend of ours. I met her through the track, White Pine Program's Tracking Apprenticeship Matt, I think you knew her from Bird Language before that. Is that right? Yeah, some some white pine programs, and then uh, we actually traveled to South Africa together uh, on our on the uh, the the wildlife tracking trip. That was pretty sweet. Got to got to do some tracking in South Africa with Sophie. Good tracking memories. and birding. Tracking and birding. <laughs> so yeah, we're we're uh, really excited to have you on, and got some questions for you, and yeah, we'll see see where the conversation leads. Sounds great. So one one thing where I was curious about interviewing other naturalists is for for some some of some people not not everybody there's sort of a kind of like a first naturalist memory or some place where where people identify as like their where their sort of naturalist story began and I'm just curious if if you have such a such a memory or or a story that you'd like to share Yeah um it's such an interesting question because I can't think of a specific moment from when I was a kid, but I know that I was nature connected and, you know, going camping when I was maybe 11 or 12 years old with my uncles, I just totally fell in love with the idea of wilderness and being outdoors. And I knew that I wanted to work outside. I had this little book that was like super well worn called Outdoor Careers. And I used to page through it and think like, okay, what's my outdoor career going to be? Am I going to be a park warden? Am I going to be a wildlife biologist? I I really wanted to be a wolf researcher because the first place Mm -hmm. I'd ever camped and really experienced wilderness was Algonquin Park, Ontario, which is just outside of my mom's hometown. First place I'd canoe camped, heard wolves howl. So I was kind of obsessed with that idea. And I ended up going into environmental sciences in university, and it took me until my third year in that program at McGill, which is up in Montreal, to actually discover the word naturalist. Hmm. Um, And so in some ways, my naturalist journey actually started really, really late, or what feels late to me. I know people who've started, you know, studying natural history in their 30s, 40s, and are incredibly accomplished. But for me, I was maybe 19 years old, and I was doing an internet search saying jobs in Algonquin Park. How can I go work in Algonquin Park for the summer? (laughs) And I saw this job posting for naturalists. And it was like the job description that wasn't included in my outdoor careers book, the one that I'd been waiting for. (laughs) Um, And it just felt like this dream that you could actually get paid to collect flora and fauna records, give guided walks, give slideshow talks. And I think I pretty naively sent in this application thinking, oh, yeah, I'm studying environmental sciences. I'm taking courses on global environmental issues and climate change and Mm -hmm. hydrology. I can be a naturalist. And, uh, you know, I was good in school and all, so I figured that was enough and didn't get a call back, you know, got (laughs) no response. Um, At the time, I probably couldn't have told like 10 different backyard birds apart. I was like that level (laughs) Um, At least when it came to like birding, you know, mammals, maybe a little bit better trees, probably not very far. Yeah. So fortunately, I did actually get a call to work at the visitor center that summer. So I ended up going and accepting this job as a museum technician, which basically means working the info desk at the park visitor center. And the best part of that job and the spot where in my mind, my naturalist journey really begins is that I got to live with the park naturalists for a summer. And so that was my exposure to birding, to tracking, to oating, you know, catching dragonflies 
and identifying them and just like general geeking out on nature with, you know, all these geeks, which is actually the the in-house word for all of the naturalists in Algonquin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was totally life changing. So yeah, yeah. So definitely, there were some earlier experiences that shaped my journey to that point, and actually wanting to be there. But as far as um, the naturalist journey and natural history, it started there. You know what's funny is so we had an episode about Algonquin that were st- when Stefan went to Algonquin, and mm-hmm. one of the things that we've noticed about Algonquin, I've only been there once. But it seems like a really like a hot spot for for naturalists and like just like it really seems to be a, an engine and creator of of a lot of cool of cool uh, naturalist geeks as they're called I guess. But, I don't know <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a really good point. And I think actually in Canada, Algonquin is the birthplace of the Natural History Interpretive Program, like the Interpretive Ranger yeah. program. And the park's been around since 1893, so it's you know not that much older than say Yellowstone. So yeah, it's cool to think yeah, that so like a, the culture of a place could really create that, you know, like it just seems like yeah. it's different than some of the national parks that we have that that might have a little bit of that, but it's so strong, so strong in Algonquin, it seems like, mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But speaking of national parks, which is an awesome segue, <laughs> <laughs> I heard that yeah. you recently went to Yellowstone National Park. and uh, Yeah, that was my latest adventure. Yeah, I was just wondering if you had if you had any stories, remarks, observations from your time there. Yeah, it was it was a pretty incredible experience. And Yellowstone's the kind of place that you go to, I think, with or at least for me, sky high expectations, you know, like the first national park, right. home of wolves, bison. You know, I'd never seen bison in the wild before. And it did not disappoint. We had this first drive in. Um, I was there with my boyfriend Aaron and we drove into the park one evening. And the only road that's open in the wintertime since we were there in February or mid January actually. Um, is the Lamar Valley Road, which is the famed location for wolf spotting and wildlife viewing. And so we were just in the far northern stretches of the park, and we had this epic drive, you know, spotting coyotes, red fox, tons of bison, elk, and then it culminated in watching three wolves approach an elk carcass, and one of them actually came and fed on it within maybe 50 yards of where we were standing at the side of the road. That's crazy. And that was like, you know, like the, the first two hours at Yellowstone, That's awesome. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, after that, like that was our best wolf sighting. So in some ways it went downhill, but it didn't really go downhill from there. And that was actually a really interesting one because we, we stopped where there was a group of cars watching this, um, this carcass and there is a bunch of ravens on it. And there were a couple of coyotes at the crest of a hill up above. So, you know, maybe 200 feet away from where this elk was. Um, and so we were, we were watching them kind of disappear and then reappear over the crest mm. of this hill, and they weren't coming down to the elk. So we stood there waiting for maybe 15 minutes, wondering if they might come. And then we got word that there is a congregation of six bull moose, which just seems unheard of to me, um, farther up the road. So we were <laughs> yeah. getting ready to take off, and we were like, oh, time to go see the moose now. And we'd gotten into the car when all of a sudden this other you know, tourist who was there is like waving to us wildly through the window and pointing. And so we get back out of the track and look up and the two coyotes were just racing. Like they're just going at full tilt, coming down the slope and actually really close to where our car was parked. And then they kind of skirted along the road and then, you know, took off to the east um, quick as they could. All the birds are still on the elk carcass. Coyotes gone. And so we got out just thinking like something's up. And we waited a full, it was probably easily a full two minutes yeah. Just sitting, waiting, anticipating. And that's when we saw a first wolf come up over that same crest where the coyotes mm. had been. And then two others. Nice. Cool bird language. Like Yeah. Coyote language. Coyote language. Whatever <laughs> whatever we call it. Uh, concentric yeah. ring. Or... That's cool. Wow. Yeah. So is that a trophic cascade? <laughs> <laughs> I knew he was going to bring this up. I don't know. <laughs> I, I guess... I'm still trying to figure this out. <laughs> Yeah, what is a trophic cascade? What is it anyway? But yeah, well, that's that's cool. I mean, it actually, the story reminded me a lot of our time in Africa, just in that there's so much like large mammal action going on all the time, where you're just kind of like, oh, there's six bull moose over here, and then there's like heavies, <laughs> and there's wolves, and there's a dead elk, and there's like, I don't know, it just yeah. sounds it reminds me of Africa. Yeah, totally. I had just come off reading um, this great book by Dan Flores called American Serengeti. 
Um, and that was kind of my transition back from Africa, thinking like, oh, here I am back in North America. I can't just wake up in the morning and watch elephants outside of my tent. What am I going to do? <laughs> and uh, started reading about the um, you know, megafauna of our own continent and getting really inspired because you still can go and experience it, you know, maybe not in the numbers like you used to be able to. You know, you can't go see a million bison stretching off to the horizon, but yeah. you can definitely go and get a sense for what's still there. And then another really cool experience, we woke up, so we were camping in the Mammoth Hot Springs campground, which is through the north entrance of the park, and uh, the only year-round campground, and we would wake up and there would be elk right outside of our tent some mornings, hmm. which was always interesting because the park messaging was that you were supposed to maintain a distance of, gosh, I can't remember, something like, you know, at least 50 feet or more from wildlife at all times. <laughs> Um, so you like open, message. you like put your head, yeah, the, the elk didn't get the memos. So you poke your head out of the tent and you're like, so am I supposed to move away now? Like, do I wait for the elk to leave? Uh, and then one night these two elk were actually sparring in the campground what? as the sun was setting. Yeah, oh it was God. wild because this is January. Like, I don't know why they're sparring in January. Yeah, um, huh. they'd just been hanging out all day, the two of them, you know, foraging, and uh, yeah, we heard the noise and I didn't realize it at first that it was coming from their mouths, but it definitely was this like almost guttural, whiny kind of vocalization as they had their antlers locked. They typically are sparring in the fall, right? Like deer, kind of the same, same rutting that's, season. That's my understanding that it would be the fall rut that would spark them to do that. So hmm. I don't know if it was like a, a test rut that these are two younger mm -hmm. bull elk hanging out together, just trying to size each other up. Um, my initial thought was, oh, they're totally fighting over who gets to feed on that shrub, um, <laughs> which is probably <laughs> false. But uh, that's what came to mind. Like, oh, of course yeah. they're fighting over food. Yeah, or if it could have been, because it was pretty mild temperatures. Um, it was hovering in the 30s, kind of like borderline between rain and snow all that week. And I was wondering if some kind of environmental cue might have made them feel like it was the rut season or approaching that. But... It didn't seem quite right. That's cool. So lots of wildlife, I guess. Yeah, really good wildlife sighting opportunities. And, and the tracking tracking was good? Tracking was great. We got way out onto a ski trail one day. We were probably five miles up a ski trail when three wolf trails just joined with us. And we got to follow the wolves in our ski tracks. Or I mean, they were yeah. Yeah, right on the pathway that we happened to be going on and just tracked them for quite a few miles, just, you know, just trotting up the pathway. So maybe that's where I actually sensed a trophic cascade, um, you know, just like the uh, feeling of being in a place where there are these big predators, like, oh, yeah, this is probably what the elk feels, too. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I wasn't necessarily afraid, but just um, just really, really aware. Uh, and I think that my awareness changed being on the trail with wolves. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we're really we're really pushing the boundaries of this trophic cascade. Thing. <laughs> it's, I like you it. are pushing the boundaries. I, I'm not. No. I'm just curious. <laughs> what it is yeah um, well for any listeners who maybe aren't familiar with the concept this is just the <laughs> idea that these um you know top predators are having an effect on lower levels of the food chain so the fact that you know wolves being reintroduced to yellowstone um is changing the behavior as well as perhaps the numbers um say of elk in the park but also discouraging them from occupying places that they might otherwise occupy where they feel vulnerable yeah, the tricky thing about going, it, it's great to go to a place like Yellowstone with an appreciation of those kinds of concepts and yeah. looking for it. But when you only go for one trip, it's hard to understand the before and after. Because right. you can find great information and, you know, video clips. There's this four-minute segment about how wolves have changed rivers by being reintroduced yeah. to Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. And this idea that, you know, their impact on the elk means that the elk are, you know, eating less vegetation in certain areas, and then there's less stream bank erosion. Right. Um, and so the rivers are actually traveling more straight. And so when you actually go to a place like that, you can kind of hold that concept in your mind. But on a first visit, it's hard to actually know right. what the difference has been since the wolves were reintroduced. But the information, the, the trophic cascade as a concept is that like when you are in Yellowstone, that's kind of in the pamphlets or like the videos or like things that are in the, I don't know, yeah. the, the station. That stuff's there? I did not see that term mentioned, although I only oh, okay. visited one one smaller visitor center because there was only one accessible to me. Basically, there's two hubs of activity, the Mammoth Hot Springs at the north end of the park and Old Faithful right. in the wintertime. But you have to travel by snow coach or on skis back country oh, cool. um, to get to that other main visitor center. Yeah, but where no. I was, I saw some information about the creation of the park 
about the history of bison there, but I didn't really see mention of trophic cascades. Okay, interesting. Yeah, they're maybe gonna, a huge they, oversight. <laughs> or maybe... I think that it's in the works. They're going to build like this, uh, this elaborate <laughs> oh, sort of God. boardwalk that allows you to access the cascades. <laughs> um, it's going to be... The Time cascades lapse. are, are going to be handicap accessible. Time lapse. Perfect. They're yeah, it's have, a like, giant... 100-year time lapse. Uh, we, we like to rag on Trophic Cascades a little bit, but we, but we enjoy thinking about it, too. But yeah, Yellowstone, Yellowstone's the birthplace of that concept, really. So we're always interested in, <laughs> to hear. The birthplace of the Trophic Cascade. <laughs> That's where you can go and see the Cascades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's so interesting, too, right? Because most people going to the park, I spoke to a lot of park visitors, like at the visitor center and the hotel area, who were made like they were talking about their travels to the park and going on these guided tours and they came back with just a photo of a wolf track and were just blown away and like just mm. looking at it like it was bigger than my hand you know this is like a six inch by six inch wolf track and just that you know is enough and that's what sticks with people perhaps more than trophic cascades that's good just a that's little what, I, that's good i that i would i would rather live in that world than the world where <laughs> people are taking away trophic cascades from their time in Yellowstone. <laughs> It, yeah, and it seems like winter's a really good time to visit the park, maybe? Winter's a great time, definitely for tracking, of course. So that was my big driver in going there. And wildlife viewing in general, yeah. um, up in the Lamar Valley. So it's just, it's super accessible. The The wolves are really active up in that area. Um, it's also great that there's a lot fewer people. So I haven't been to the park right. in the summer. I can't really offer comparison, but I think the park sees... I forget how many million visitors yeah. a year, but something like, you know, like one percent of them come in the summer, or sorry, in the winter, something yeah. like that. Yeah, um, it's got to be like five to ten million because here in Acadia it's like three point five, and this is like much smaller park and, but. Yeah, I, I might be off by a factor of ten, but I think it's something like a hundred thousand winter visitors total. It may even be ten thousand. Yeah. It definitely wasn't a million. So, yeah. um, so you kind of feel like you have the park to yourself. In yeah, some ways, great. like you're the only person on the ski trails or the wolf trails. Um, you know, it's there's just enough people on the roads that you can stop where people are congregated. And especially if they have spotting scopes, you're like, oh, there's the wolf spotting crew. There's people who <laughs> yeah. just go out every day oh, totally. yeah. and find the wolf packs. And I don't even know how they find them because they're like little specks even through spotting scopes sometimes. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and they know them all by name and number and all the yeah. details of the pack. So it's it's pretty great for that. Yeah, that's always pretty neat. I mean, I guess some of those wolves have, like, social media profiles and stuff. <laughs> like, because, you know, they're followed so closely that, like, someone creates, like, a Facebook page for them. And then, you know, you can follow the wolf739ab <laughs> on Facebook and then, like, get updated on what it's up to. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm actually I'm trying to find because the wolf that I saw I know was 926, which is the alpha female of one of the packs, but I can't find her Facebook page. Oh no! There's, there's a bar <laughs> called 926. It's just not the same thing. I just think that's so funny that, to live in a day and age when uh, wild animals have Facebook pages. <laughs> They're like celebrity wild animals, though. They're like they don't know it. Probably, maybe they do know it. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. Well, and she, the one that I saw is apparently one of the more bold ones. So her other two pack members wouldn't come down to feed on the elk next to the road. And generally, they're really skittish around roads, um, whereas the coyotes are, are less so. So it was interesting. So she's probably one of the more famous wolves since she is very people friendly, I suppose. Hmm. Yeah. She doesn't mind being in the public eye. Yeah. She just sees the cameras and she comes right on down. See? So... Uh, tell us about tell us about what you're doing in Burlington with the tracking mammal tracking project there. Yeah, so this is actually something that arose when I was taking the wildlife tracking apprenticeship at White Pine um, that we got invited to do a project, and um, I decided I wanted to set about trying to document where the large mammals are in Burlington, which is something that had been done about 15 years ago, a project by a mentor of mine named Alicia Daniel, and so there was this study that was. Yeah, outdated by a decade and a half, trying to identify wildlife corridors. Yeah, it was it was a pretty fun project because the city of Burlington is really committed to protecting open spaces and even has in some other city planning documents this commitment to protecting wildlife corridors. And yet there's really, really little knowledge of where these wildlife corridors actually are. And so in practice, 
what's been happening over the last decade or so is that more development and increasing population has seen a lot of the remaining habitat get fragmented. And sometimes these just like little pieces of forgotten forests that happen to be these vital connecting pieces between larger natural areas just get swallowed up or, mm-hmm. or you know, cut down without somebody even thinking about it. So the idea behind the project is to try to get a better sense of where the largest and widest ranging mammals in Burlington are living and where they're crossing roads and what little connecting strips of forest they're using towards the goals of being able to conserve those and just raise public awareness about the large mammals around town. So is it in terms of raising public awareness, is it is it like a lot of stuff that residents wouldn't necessarily know was going on, like some activity that that, that is uh, sort of going unnoticed? Yeah, I'd say most of it goes unnoticed. And and it's always interesting because here in Burlington, most people are really friendly towards wildlife, whereas, well, and then like a few are, are scared, you know, at the potential of there being fishers in their backyard, for instance. But yeah, Burlington has enough habitat. It's about 20% open space in the city. And it's a fairly small city. Like the greater population is 100,000 people in the area. The downtown, like Burlington itself is 40,000 people. And so there's there's a lot of wild space and a lot of wild habitat. So all of the mammals you'd expect to find all through Vermont, the larger ones, have been spotted within Burlington city boundaries, including black bear, although it's been like 20 years. And we know that we don't have black bear habitat here, but there has been sign found. We have fishers, coyotes, occasional bobcat passing through, red and gray fox, otters, beavers. Those are all the, the biggest ones that we track. Yeah. No so, cat amount. No cat amount, but we do hear reports. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. always the. Is it a mountain there's lion? The, yeah, there's the bronze mountain lion statue at the University of Vermont campus. That's maybe as close as we get, and we get occasional moose. Actually, every couple of years, it seems a young moose disperses down the Winooski River corridor. Oh comes into town and then doesn't know what to do. And and that's a really difficult one because the whole point of the project is to place these mammal sightings on a map, you know, usually yeah. just showing points of where they've been observed. And this moose, or, you know, the couple of moose that have come through town have traveled all over the place, like up to the university campus, down all the main roads, on the pavement, also through some small strips of forest, which, which highlights some of the more natural corridors they might use. One of them actually went into somebody's backyard where it was being chased by wildlife officers and they discovered this um, pot grow up. And, he, you know, this guy got busted for growing marijuana in his backyard <laughs> thanks to the moose. Thanks to the <laughs> moose. That one made national headlines. Oh, my God. That's um, hilarious. Yeah. So, so it's tricky to figure out how to put those on the map. But those stories, you know, definitely stand out to people and... Yeah, it's it's great. So a lot of the time when I'm tracking, I've, I've recruited a team of volunteers who use this tool called iNaturalist to submit their sightings. And it's usually just like a photo of a track that they find. And you don't even have to know what the track is. You know, it could be a domestic dog. It could be a coyote and they can post photos. And then there's a, a group of naturalists who will go on and verify those sightings. Hmm. So, yeah. And so in the process, I'll also be going out and, and following trails and doing my own investigation and, and trying to add as many data points as possible. And often I'll get on a trail and rather just rather than just putting a point on the map, I'll actually follow that animal for as long as possible to try to understand where it's moving, you know, where it's going. And uh, sometimes that's right on the edge of people's backyards. And then I'll be in like this awkward position of, do I try to stay hidden or, yep. you know, do oh, I really feel that I'm actually God. trespassing? This um, is a classic debate <laughs> among naturalists. Do yeah. you reveal yourself or do you hide more? Because <laughs> then if yeah. you're seen, if you're hiding more and then yeah. you're seen, you're really suspicious. <laughs> we always talk about this when we go yeah. birding because we're like, find ourselves like under a bush somewhere, like looking for something. Then, with binoculars. Yeah, with binoculars too. And then and then people are walking by and you're like, "Do I say hey from inside the bush?" Yeah, and startle them because sometimes they have no idea that you're there. I'd say, I'd say most of the time and then you could really startle them. But it's weird not to say anything and then they see what if they see you? <laughs> so that's the thing. It is. Yeah. Uh, I've had some really good experiences and I I think that could also be because I'm like a fairly young woman and I look like I'm smiling and looking completely unthreatening, I would hope. I think um, I look pretty you know, threatening. Whereas, Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whereas if I were Stefan, you know, like they'd run away. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I usually verge on the side of saying hi and I open with something like, oh, have you ever noticed foxes around here? Like this one time I was on a fox trail and I ended up 
in someone's backyard. I wasn't actually on her property. I was I was kind of in a no man's land strip of woods right outside of it. And uh, of course, right as I'm going by, this woman, Elisa, comes out and she's delivering some compost to her backyard compost pile. And so I say, hey, have you ever seen foxes around here? Like, I'm just on a fox yeah. trail right now. <laughs> And she just starts going on and on with all these stories, oh, saying awesome. like, oh, yeah, there was a gray fox. I have some pictures. Um, that's why there's fencing around my yard, because it was coming and trying to get my chickens when I had backyard chickens. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, I have pictures of deer and woodpeckers. And did you know a moose once came through here? Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's I think that I've had stories like experiences like that as well. I think it's probably best practice to just to reach out and say hi <laughs> most of the yeah. time. <laughs> I'd say almost every time reach out and say hello it's probably well, yeah. especially where, where you're part of your intention is to raise awareness around this yeah stuff. It's yeah like, oh that's a good to, point yeah <laughs> totally to make your presence known yeah on the flip side though you know i might have said oh do you know that there's a fox or a coyote or a fisher here and i could have had somebody really frightened um oh, yeah. which is definitely an opportunity for some education mm-hmm. and that's normally when i mention that there are fishers around burlington people respond in like one of two ways number one is oh, yeah, I heard somebody's cat got eaten, or, yeah, I'd better keep my cat inside. Or number two is, oh, yeah, I've heard their terrible screams in the night. Oh, my God. (laughs) They're so terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you're so you're using iNaturalist to collect your your data, and is that is that seem like a good a good app for that? Is that working well? I mean, you can get location, right? And you can get a photo. So those are two really important things, it seems like. Yeah, it it works really well for the data collection side of things. The data display is maybe less than ideal because what you end up with is a map just populated with blue dots, right. which kind of look mm-hmm. like a Google map pin, um, kind of these like upside down teardrops. And uh-huh. so I end up taking that data, verifying it, and then turning it into something prettier, which takes yeah. a good amount of time. But definitely on the data collection side, it's pretty simple. Anybody can sign up for an account. It's a pretty quick process. And I realize that having to sign up can be a barrier to some people or it's like yeah. just enough effort that they don't want to do it. But more and more people are becoming aware of iNaturalist on their smartphones, which is a super handy way to add sightings. Yeah. Um, thanks to the identification tools that they have. So you can actually take a photo of a track and then even if you have no idea what it is, iNaturalist will come up with a guess. And it can be creepily accurate. Yep. We yeah, we've gone over Yeah, this. and I think you've talked about it, right? Yeah. So it's creepy with the plants, actually. I feel, like, really creeped out sometimes. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, totally tra- useless. I've, I've noticed that for track, the domestic animals are underrepresented on there, and so there's a tendency for it to want to mm, call a dog track a coyote track, huh. in my experience. So, because you know, you people can't... people aren't taking pictures of dog tracks. <laughs> yeah. Like, or... Who wants this? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. And, and that's just, like, one experience. So, yeah. You know... But, but regardless well. of, of iNaturalist's ability to identify some or help you identify something, it's really it is a really good app for collecting information and like it's useful because it's connecting like a community a little bit around around the tracks, the tracking and the corridors and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. So as soon as I found that I could actually create a project page for the Burlington Tracking Project, that's when I was sold on iNaturalist because it yeah. wasn't just me searching the database of all of the mm-hmm. Um, potential sightings out there, but being able to house them in one place. And then people who are members of the project can go and they can comment on each other's sightings yeah. and offer feedback. So I mean, it's that's really pretty great cool. for beginning naturalists. When you think about it as like, it's kind of like a social media platform for naturalists. And there's like that part, of, like we railed on iNaturalist to some extent in when we, co- <laughs> when we reviewed it <laughs> because no, we, we get creeped not. out. You railed on it. Come on, man. <laughs> I didn't rail on it. I was skeptical. <laughs> But we've gotten some good feedback from listeners and like people who like push back and been like, no, it's actually like really useful. And like this is a perfect example, I think, of its usefulness, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important to be aware of the limitations, you know, because I, I collect point data and anybody can contribute sightings and I can verify it. But all that I'm getting, you know, all that I know is that there was a deer at this location at one point or there was a red uh-huh. fox at this location. I don't know if that same red fox has been recorded 20 times or just once. Right. You know? so it, That's a good point. So it basically, yeah, it gives you some information about occurrence and where animals are traveling, which at this point is enough for this project because there's That's the question, not much awareness really. at all. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It could get to a point where there's almost too many data points that it starts uh-huh. to become a little unintelligible and um, or we might just want to be asking more right. sophisticated questions about relative densities of animals. Or one thing yeah. I, I wonder about a lot is, just because there's a fisher 
in my backwoods or in a big wild area in the city doesn't actually mean that that's good habitat for that fisher. It could and just so, be exploring or something, right? It could be exploring. It could actually be a population sink. So maybe this habitat mm -hmm. is attractive to fishers and then actually they all just end up dying because of roadkill mortality or... Mm -hmm. Or whatever else and so so that's one thing I wonder about a lot like should there be fishers is it good for there to be fishers in proximity to people and I think yes yeah. Yeah. Um, but just trying to, to keep that question in mind and wonder what all the implications are but to get back to the the benefits too of iNaturalist especially on the wildlife tracking side of things is that there's a much larger project called the North American Wildlife Tracking Database I believe and it has hundreds of members and thousands of observations on it. So all of the sightings for the Burlington Tracking Project also get tagged to that North American database. And there's a pretty large core of trackers on there who can help to verify the sightings. Mm. So it's not just me and other experienced trackers coming on board, but the project actually expands and it gets some draw from across the continent because we're contributing to that larger project. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll link that in our show notes so people can get there. Sophie, are, is every point every data point coming in having to be verified by you before it can before it like goes into sort of the the map that you yeah you mentioned with, with all the the little pins on it? Yeah, that's one part of the process that I'm trying to refine because right now I do end up going and verifying each data point because I want to be really sure. iNaturalist does have a built-in verification pro process, and that's if two other members verify your identification, I think it takes a total of three, then it gets something called a research grade identification okay. or like research grade designation. Right, right. So, I saw that on there actually. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of them yeah. are just, a lot of them don't have that. And, but then ma many of them do. Yeah. So there's the issue because often, especially for some of my own sightings, like I'll feel, you know, 99% confident I'm trailing a red fox and yeah. have all the evidence to prove it. And so I can be a little bit lazy sometimes in my own documentation, but I know when I pull my records that I've only put stuff on there that I feel very certain about. And so I feel really comfortable. And then in other cases, you know, I'm just looking to see that there's enough photo evidence. So it is entirely possible that some sightings will will not get the research grade designation, either because not enough trackers have gone on to confirm it or because the photo evidence isn't quite good enough and it's a little questionable. And so I want to try to capture as many of those sightings as possible. So I don't want to just toss aside all the ones that aren't research grade. So that's mm -hmm. where the time kind of comes in. And I end up spending a lot of time trying to to piece together the puzzle of some of those other sightings. When oh. you mentioned that you had that sometimes you'll rather than just look at one track and use that as a data point that you'll follow a trail. Is there a way that you can use the program to plot like lines? Like I feel like it would be really neat to see, you know, l lines of trails and seeing if they sort of coalesce in a certain way. Yeah. I haven't figured out how exactly to map that kind of spaghetti line map. Or, I mean, like I, I can imagine putting the lines on. And so iNaturalist doesn't allow for that. It only takes point data but I do have a GPS app on my phone. I use Gaia GPS so I can record a track that I'm following. Mm -hmm. And that's really useful, really, really useful information for the project. But it's a lot trickier to represent in the final maps. So right. normally what happens, though, is that you know, each of those points does tell a story, each point on the map. And sometimes a string of those points together tells the story. So if I'm on a trail and I'm using iNaturalist to document, I might make a point when I first come across the tracks and then I'll add another if that animal crossed a road, or I'll add another if it went and denned in a tree, basically like all the points of interest, and I'll take photo documentation. But yeah, more than the points of the map, really, it's some of those individual stories that really come out. And so one example is that there's, so the strip of woods where I actually met that woman, Elisa, who came out her door and was looking to feed her chickens and yeah. told me about all of the different wildlife coming through that little back strip of woods. She also informed me that there was a business just on the other side. And, and we're talking about a patch of woods that's maybe 20 yards across at most. And so there was a business on the other side that was about to do an expansion and they were set to cut into that strip of woods. Mm. And so like the alarm bells were kind of going off because the thought was, well, you know, if wildlife is coming through here now, what if it gets thinned out to the point where it becomes a real pinch point and maybe they're not going to be traveling through these woods anymore? And this happened to be in a spot where I know fisher, deer, red fox, gray fox are all using that little strip of woods as a connector between two large hundred plus acre natural areas. So that's really their way of dispersing between those two larger areas. So 
having all these stories of the wildlife in that area, I ended up going to a neighborhood planning assembly, which is basically a Burlington, you know, town meeting specific to like that particular part of the city. And um, the owner of the business who was looking to do that expansion and cut the woods, and he, they did end up going and like cutting into the woods in part, but they were also there and they were trying to get public feedback from the neighbors, trying to understand what the impacts were to the aesthetics and like other considerations and basically trying to be like good, you know, business neighbors to this neighborhood right behind um, their spot. So I went into this meeting and kind of raised my hand and mentioned that I run this tracking project and explained about all the different mammals that were making use of that area, not to mention the birds and, and you know, other smaller creatures. And they were really eager to hear. And it was just something that wasn't in their awareness at all. That's so cool. Yeah. And there's no, there's no actual like city regulation or ordinance or anything that says that a business owner has to care about fishers right. or foxes in their backwoods. <laughs> but, but I guess, you know, they cared enough as people or for public perception that, um, yeah. Yeah, they were willing to hear it. And I was able to send them maps and say, you know, here are the stories of some of the animals that are moving around back there. And long story short, there's now an awareness of what's there and a commitment to try to plant some more shrub cover along the edge, you know, yeah. preferencing some native plants. And they did install some fencing because they wanted to create a visual barrier between this like new industrial facility and where the neighbors were. But they made it a staggered panel fence. So there's basically overlapping panels that are right. um, offset in such a way that animals can actually move between them. That's cool. Mm -hmm. And that's from a lot of it came from what you were what you were presenting to them. Yeah, that was a direct result of yeah. my showing up there and sending in a map. And then I went to a future meeting when they were discussing the details of it. And you know, as as much as I spend a ton of time tracking and and learning about wildlife, I still feel like a novice in so many ways. But yeah. I was clearly the expert in the room, so I showed up at this conservation board meeting. Um, and so this is a, a town committee that was overseeing or, you know, looking at the plans for this industrial expansion. And and really, they just had some advisory power. Like there was no actual, you know, regulatory process or anything like that. Like they couldn't actually stop this this business from developing or cutting the forest, but they were there to advise. And I had this room of, you know, like 10 people just looking at me and saying like, okay, you know what the mammals are doing here. Like, how big should the spaces be between the fence panels? <laughs> <laughs> like, what kind of vegetation would you plant here? What do you, you think is going to happen if you do this? <laughs> yeah, which like it's, yeah, it's super humbling. And it's yeah. a really great reminder that even if you think that you know nothing about tracking, if you have any awareness of animals that are moving in your backwoods, it's quite possible that you could show up at a mm -hmm. city meeting like yeah. one of these ones and be the expert in the room. Yeah, that's really cool. That gets to a question that I really that I wanted to ask you, which is why should someone get involved with like a project like this, um, like citizen science in general? Like, why should people go out of their way to maybe like contribute some data to a project like the Burlington Tracking Project or something like like the Maine Bird Atlas or you know anything like that? In the case of the Burlington Mammal Project, it's um, you know, the, the public contributions are, are what we've got, right? There's nobody getting um, paid to collect this data and to advocate for wildlife. And so I think in many cases, being able to, to outsource the collection, so to speak, um, through citizen science projects actually makes it possible to build up this awareness and understanding. And I imagine the same could go, like there are a lot of, of birders out there, but, you know, the more people who are contributing records to something like a bird atlas or um, a reptile and amphibian atlas, yeah. Um, the stronger the the overall quality and and the better our understanding of those animals. One of the things that Steph and I were talking about with citizen science and why I think it's so cool is it really like I think it it create it in its in best case scenario it would create a world where people know what's going on more. <laughs> in other words, like they don't just read in the newspaper. All right, let's see. Uh, all right, so uh, robin populations are are falling. And that's interesting. That's like an interesting thing to read. But like, what if we know that because of our own experience and like we go actually observe those things over time and through the years and with tracking, it could be like, oh, I saw the wildlife corridor change in this way and being involved with a project like yours, like, you know, things will nature changes, like things will change. And like being a part of something like that, you would be a part of like observing that kind of stuff. And that for me is like, so freaking cool if people are doing that everywhere like that's really interesting to have a, you know a population or a group of people that are that know that kind of have that kind of knowledge you know i i liken it to like everybody knows the price of gasoline 
right? Like if the price of gasoline goes up like 10% or even 5%, people will probably notice, right? Oh, it went up 10 cents. It's like nothing, but people notice that kind of stuff. And everybody would notice that kind of stuff. And like the price of milk or anything like that. But with nature, like not so much. But it's like so such a possibility, right? Where where we really could, if we if now that the technology's there and the and the communication systems are there, like we're we could live in a world where we really are in touch with that kind of stuff. Like uh, we have our finger on the pulse, and everybody kind of knows just like when gasoline goes up or down, you know what these populations are doing, what the what's going on with the corridors and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's my little stump speech. For citizen science. <laughs> yeah, well, no, for, for sure, because, yeah, beyond the data, it really is about building relationship with these local places and, and building up connection and empathy, I think, with the other than human creatures that are out there. So, yeah, so definitely, you know, we I started the project looking to collect a whole bunch of data and hopefully apply it towards city planning. But my my secret wish was that I wanted to build up a community of trackers yeah. in the area and find other people who cared about wildlife. And so that's definitely been a big success. Just hearing people's stories day to day about the animals that they're encountering, the tracks that they're seeing, and being able to share the excitement, even when it's something super common, like just noticing gray squirrel activity in your backyard yeah. or noticing a deer come through the woods is just, it's yeah. really exciting to me. Yeah, and I think, you know, for our listeners out there, you know, by participating in something like this, you're going to be giving something really important, but you're also going to be getting a lot out of it. You know, you're going to be getting, you know, this community of naturalists and you're going to be like, you know, receiving a lot of, of cool information and knowledge and, and community. Yeah, you're, so. you're, you're plugged into all these individual, you know, you're making your own individual observations but then you're also by contributing those to the greater pool, you're then also getting, you know, hundreds of, you know, however many other people are, are also plugged into that pool. You're getting that, you know, a more, a broader sort of understanding of yeah. what's going on in your area. All those little upside down teardrops or whatever. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, and what I love too is that the, the connections, like I run a tracking club that's kind of, you know, in conjunction with this project. Not everybody who shows up at Tracking Club each month is actually submitting sightings, but there is some overlap and, and there's community building around that. But then there's also the online community through the iNaturalist portal, yeah. through different Facebook groups. And and it's just such a good way of telling your story. It makes me think of your your Triforce, you know, and the storytelling aspect yeah. of being a naturalist. And And so often I go out in the woods and I spend, you know, three hours out there on my own. And I come back with tons of stories that I write in my journal, but then being able to share those online and then yep. get feedback. Yeah. You know, post it in the form of a story or a sighting. Like there's so many great Facebook groups out there for those who are on Facebook to report animal tracks and wildlife sightings and, um, you know, get help with identifications. And there's so much community around that whole online world as well. Yeah. No, it's cool. And and there's so I many projects to be involved with, too. Um, you know, here in Maine, I'll be working on the Maine Bird Atlas. Here's my little Maine Bird Atlas plug. But, you know, we need volunteers really badly right now. We need like a thousand volunteers and we're at like a hundred or something. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's a big project to do with a breeding bird survey of the entire state of Maine. And yeah. it's going to be an it's like amazing to see all the all the energy and time that's already been put in, but we need more people and it it would be awesome if any listeners out there want to join in and you can uh you can get involved with that. There's all kinds of projects. Yeah, I think it can maybe be overwhelming um yes. if you're just you know, if you're just like, "Oh, citizen science, like let's type that into Google and see what <laughs> comes up in my area." But yeah, my recommendation would be for for people who are looking to get plugged in in that way is to just choose a species, choose an area that seems, you know, most compelling or ask around and maybe there's somebody in your, your personal network already who's working on something like this or, but yeah, I definitely have like followed my passion and curiosity in the realm of animal tracking. And, you know, I'm not right now contributing to a birding atlas or something like that. Shame well, on yeah, me. you can't do it all. Um, but... <laughs> but yeah, you, you can't do it all. Right. So yeah, just choosing and acknowledging that you don't need to, yeah, you don't and you shouldn't need to do it all. Mm -hmm. um, so just pick what's most compelling to you and see if there's a project or see if you can find some people to start something. Well, thank you so much, Sophie, for, for being with us today and, and sharing your stories and your tracking experience and, and uh, your project with us. And what's your website again? Yeah, so if you want to find me online, it's trackingvt.org. 
Um, or you can look up the Burlington VT Mammal Tracking Project if you're on iNaturalist. Cool. Yeah. So, and if you're in Burlington, check that out. Help contribute to that project, and uh, and you and then you run you run a a tracking club there too. Yeah. So the tracking club details you can find on that same website. Um, we meet once a month on a Sunday, um, and we explore this area called Rock Point, right on the Lake Champlain shoreline in Burlington. All right. Cool. Well, I guess that wraps it up. Thanks a lot, Sophie. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, thanks, thanks so much. Hey, should we talk about snow yeah. fleas today? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so the th- snow fleas. Everybody has always told me that snow fleas taste like garlic, and I oh they God. never taste like garlic to me. They uh, taste like dirt. And but oh, recently, it tastes like garlic. No, 